Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to a new week. I uh, hope you had a blessed weekend. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. So maybe one of us can please lead in prayer. Christopher, uh, is it okay if you can lead in prayer for us? Okay. Okay, anybody else can lead, please. Tarun, Simran. Sure, I, I'll lead. Go ahead. Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this uh, day where we gather to learn. Father, we pray and invite your spirit to teach us and let it be your wisdom uh, that, uh, that helps us to learn. Father, we thank you, Lord. We pray uh, as we as we learn that uh, our hearts are open and that we get to learn the things that uh, really stir us up and uh, take us to the new levels that you want us to move, Lord. We thank you for this class. Uh, we pray and submit this totally unto you. We thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tarun. All right. So last week, uh, we did chapter three and chapter four. And so in in chapter three and chapter four, Paul, the apostle, begins to uh, address the first issue of the church in Corinth, right? And we saw that the first issue was division. There were some who were saying Paul, some were saying Peter, some were saying Paulus, and there was division within the church. So Paul, the apostle Paul, brings out uh, all the important aspects, right? He says how, as a body, we are to be one in mind, one in the spirit, and every gift that we have, everything that has been given to us is given by God. And so there's no place of division. There's no place of a person taking honor. And of course, he says that powerful yet very important words. He says, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Paul sowed the seed, Apollos watered, but God made it grow. Right, so there was. So it's not about the person, but it's about what God is doing. So, chapter three and four, he addresses that issue, right, and he brings that whole issue to a conclusion. He says, "Okay, now as a body of Christ, let us continue to be in unity and oneness, because that is what uh, the church must look like, right." And now uh, he moves on, and in the next chapter, chapter five. He addresses the second issue, right? Now, let's see what the second issue is. I'll just uh, share the, present the notes, okay? So chapter five, the second issue, right? Uh, immediately from the first issue, he's, he, we see that he's not wasting any time. The Apostle Paul is not you know, beating around the bush. He's not saying, okay, you know, try to be in unity. No, he's put his stance, he's said, you know, this is what God expects of the church. He moves on. And now the second issue uh, that was troubling the Corinthian church was sexual sin in the church, right? And the entire chapter five, he's talking about sexual sin. Now, this chapter is a very important chapter, yet it's a chapter that uh, people have a lot of questions, right? Uh, uh, it may look like a very stern chapter, uh, and it is a very stern chapter, right? Uh, Paul makes some uh, drastic decisions in this chapter. But let us look at why sexual sin within the church uh, can really you know, destroy the unity of, the, of a local church, right? It can, because it is the work of the enemy. And so we look at this chapter, and just for our understanding, the chapter is divided into three sections. We see here against action, action against sin in the local church, then the unleavened bread in the Passover lamb, and relating to those who are willful sin, right? Okay, so let's go down. And we'll also talk about, you know, this whole thing of grace and, uh, you know, uh, and how grace and correction needs to be put together, grace and truth come together. We'll talk about all that, right? So chapter 5 and verse 1, okay? Uh, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you 
and such sexual immorality is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife right now sexual immorality in Greek means pornea refers to all kinds of sexual activity outside of marriage right now we must understand right as we already mentioned keep this in the background right so what kind of church is current you've got you've got the uh, you know a temple of Aphrodite you've got thousands of prostitutes Gentiles and then you also got Jews right so sexual sin was not something new right uh, it, it was not something that uh, people oh, you know uh, we should avoid this it was not it was a normal thing in Corinth especially right but for the Jews it was not a normal thing right? they knew you know the Old Testament the scriptures talks about you know how we must uh, you know God is against sexual immorality so the Jews knew but the Gentiles they they don't care they they, they have come from you know a completely different background they have become believers um, but the sexual conduct right their their lifestyle was not right in front of uh, people in front of the eyes of God so Paul is here addressing the problem right he's saying this is not how a church should be this is not how a believer should be right verse 2 and you are puffed up and you have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from you now it's not like the entire church is more there were few people in the church who were involved in sexual immorality, right? But he says here, the Corinthian Christians who were puffed up, which means they were arrogant, they were proud, and they were tolerating this person. It could have been one person or could have been many other people also, uh, but they were tolerating this man or woman who was involved in sexual sin. And Paul is rebuking them, right? Uh, he's trying to say, hey, they should, as believers, as you know, people who believe in Jesus, they should be mourning, they should be grieved about this sin, right? Because the Holy Spirit is in them. Now, picture this, right? Remember, we, we know that the whole you know this Corinthian church was a church where all the gifts of the Spirit are already manifesting the Holy Spirit is manifesting yet the believers in the church looked at a person who was involved in sexual immorality and they tolerated it right they said oh, it's okay right and they didn't mourn they didn't grieve they didn't repent of that sin right and that's why Paul goes on later he says I mean, he needs to be removed from the local church community but they did not do that right so I've just put a note here there is grace but but there are consequences for wrongdoings right God is a gracious God now this is a balance that uh, each one of us as believers especially as leaders uh, we must develop in this right so there is grace God is gracious he gives us grace but God is also a God who is you know who 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 does things in the right way right uh, and if we take wrong decisions if we are knowing the truth going away from things and you know continue to living in sin we will have to face the consequences of our wrongdoing now what's more important that one person who is causing problem in the church or the entire church obviously it's the entire church right so the Apostle Paul is trying to protect the church and he's upset with the believers he's with the probably with the leaders in the church said, how can you tolerate somebody who's involved in sexual sin and not repenting of it but you know he, he, he's just coming to church every you know week involving himself what is going to happen his his nature is going to rub off on others and others will 
you know, there will be two kinds of people. One will say, hey, if he's involved in you know, these sexual sins and he's coming and people are accepting him, so even I can do that. That's one kind of people. The other group of people may say, hey, he's involved in all these sexual sins. Why isn't the leadership doing anything about it? Right? So then again, it could be a cause of division. So Paul is really being stern in this matter. Right? Verse 3 to 5. Uh, feel free to stop me, right? If you have any questions, this is a very important chapter, so uh, we can spend a little more time on this, right? So verse 3 to 5. For indeed, as absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have already judged as though I were present, him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, look at these words. It's so strong, right? Apostle Paul is saying, verse 5, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now, uh, let us ponder on this verse, right? Because we may misinterpret this verse and may think, hey, why is Paul delivering such a, you know, God has brought us out of Satan's uh, grip and why is Paul saying deliver him to Satan, right? Uh, but the verse is actually self-explanatory. It says, deliver one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, right? Uh, now, the apostle, he condemned or he sentenced the man living in sin as if he was physically, you know, even though he was not physically present there, he condemned the man as if he was there, right? He says, by the authority that the Lord Jesus has given me as an apostle, as a father, I am condemning this act, right? And, and a side note here, Paul mentions that the local church gathered in the name of Jesus. And wherever uh, a local church, church gathered, the Lord Jesus was present, present among them. So this is interesting, right? Uh, even though it's a, just a side note here, even if we are 10 people as a church, or we are 10,000 people, when we gather together in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, his power, the dunamis power of Jesus is present there. You know, the reason I want to emphasize this is we've come to a day and age where sometimes we feel only, you know, we look at these mega churches around us, especially in the West, and we desire, I wish I was, you know, uh, I wish one day, and that's good, right? That's good to desire. Uh, but it's also important to remember that even if it's 10 people pres present together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, his dunamis power is there. Right? So what was Paul's sentence on this man? He says, Paul delivered or turned him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now let's look at that, right? What does deliver mean? such a one to Satan mean, right? So the person who was involved in this sexual sin is sent out of the fellowship or the protection of the local church. Now, here's the reason why, right? There are two kinds of people. Always remember this. One, there are people who sin, right? And there's a conviction of the Holy Spirit, and they repent of the sin, and they and you know they don't want to repeat it, right? and they try to live a holy life. But there are the, the second type of people who sin or do something wrong and evil in the eyes of God. Now, when I say sin, it does not only mean sexual sin, right? Uh, it could be rebellion, it could be anger, it could be jealousy, pride, right? There are some people who, who sin and they don't repent of it. They, 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 they feel that they're right, 
right? Uh, they feel that that's, there's nothing wrong in this. I've not done anything wrong. They're not willing to repent, right? And so that is what is happening in the church in Corinth. This man or this person who was involved in sexual immorality knew that he's living in sin, yet did not you know, have this heart of repentance, but he continued to come to church, continued to have fellowship with people in the church as if there was nothing wrong, as if he didn't do anything wrong. Now, that is why Paul is saying this should stop. But if there's a person who's willing, you know, they, we all sin, right? But when, when we say, okay, God, please forgive me, I should not have done this, and we repent, there's where God's grace comes. And of course, leaders will also show grace. Always remember, grace and truth go along together. Right? And we'll talk about more of that later on as well. Right? So it's not that Apostle Paul is saying, oh, hey, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's no grace for this person. For He is being gracious, but he's also saying, okay, he needs to you know, make things right. So take him out of this, uh, out of the church for now. And he's no longer under the protection, the spiritual protection of the Lord. And he's no longer under the spiritual protection of the church. So what does it mean to deliver one such a one to Satan? Paul is simply stating that when this happens, he is, uh, Mange, Mange, I'll just come to you, right? Uh, what happens is he to deliver one to Satan means that he's stepping out of the protection that the Lord Jesus has for him. Right? So the enemy can you know, do anything with this person's life. The protection of God has been released because there's continual sin that is happening, continual uh, uh, unwillingness to repent. Right. So what Paul was referring to in the destruction of the flesh means to deliver this person to Satan because it's not like we're taking him and saying, okay, Satan, take this is easy for you. No, it only means that uh, uh, he, he's out of the protection of God and out of the protection of the local church community. Right. Uh, yes, go ahead, Mangi. You have you raised your hand. Thank you, Pastor. Yes, Mangi. Um, just on, 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 on the topic you are, you are yeah. explaining right now, um, just ask the question. If you, you, you send him out of the uh, of the church, how 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 is it going to be out of uh, God's protection? Because uh, first of all, salvation is personal, and mm. as a community, as a local church, is it's a it's a believer, uh, individual person who meets Jesus in in their own way or even in the church, then they decide to come together to worship the God of the they said mm -hmm. and secondly what does it mean that if it is told be said if 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 he's a sinner and is thrown out of the church and if he didn't know god before that how is he so is how is he going to be saved if he didn't know god when he's a is already a sinner or he's already lost thank mm -hmm. you okay that's that's a very good question, uh, Mangi. Okay, so let me answer the first part of your question, right? Now, we know that when we follow, when we obe when we are obedient to God's word, when we are obedient, when you know the Holy Spirit inside us, we are we know that God's protection is over us, right? Uh, we trust it. We have faith in God. That okay, Psalms ninety one. There's there's plenty of verses that God talks about God's protection. Right now, for example, if I know all of this, right? Uh, before I start this, Mangi, this person was a believer in the church, right? So 
remember he knows about jesus this person right he 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 knows about the gospel he's part of the local church right now if i for example just keep on sinning right uh and and you know i don't repent of it say no it's okay nothing nothing will happen you know I, I I don't want to you know listen to God. I don't want to obey this. I will walk in what I want to do. I will com commit sexual immorality. I will do this. I will, you know, sin. Living a continuous sinful life. Now, what is going to happen? The Holy Spirit is 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 not somebody who will force himself upon us, right? What am I doing? I I'm stepping out of what Jesus has for me, right? what the Bible talks or, or tells you know about protection and all. I'm stepping out of it, right? So what is happening? I am making myself vulnerable for the enemy to come and destroy my flesh, right? In the sense, now if I say God, for example, right? Uh, say there is somebody who is, you know. Uh, uh, just an example, involved in pornography, right? And he's a believer, but somehow he, every now and then, he just keeps watching pornography. But there will come a time, if he does not repent, he'll say, it's okay, I can't help it. And what is he doing? He is stepping, he is taking himself out of God's protection, and he's letting the enemy to work in that person's life, right? So when a person, during the early church times, when a person is out of the church, he's out of the spiritual authority uh, placed over the leadership there, right? So Paul is trying to say, it's not that we want to see this man destroyed, but we want to see him restored so that one day he will look back and he'll say, okay, what I did was wrong. What what the life that I'm living right now is wrong, and somehow, you know, by the work of God, he will repent of his sins and his soul will be saved. Now, the word "saved," right, means sozo. Remember, we studied this in uh, 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 lifestyle evangelism. Sozo. He's not talking about his soul will be. Uh, you know, he's not talking about Second Corinthians five seventeen, a new creation, all things. He's not talking about that. He's not talking about that salvation experience. He's talking about he will be saved from the works of the enemy. Right. So we can be saved. We say, pray, God, Lord Jesus, come into our hearts. We are saved as a person. We receive salvation, but after that, we can still fall into the enemy's traps. Why is it that there are so many believers or people who have accepted Jesus still living in continual sin? It's because we are, you know, we are not placing ourselves under the protection of God. Right? We are being vulnerable to the enemy. Right? So basically, what Paul is saying here is: let him go. You're protecting the church. Let him go out of the church. Let him figure out things because he, this one person cannot affect the entire church. And even as he goes, we are not causing him to, you know, so that he, you know, uh, he lives the sinful life and he dies and he goes to hell. That's not what his desire is. But Apostle Paul is saying, one day we deliver him to Satan so that, meaning he has already been living in this sin. So, one day that he you know he will come out of that sin he will recognize and by god's grace he will ask for forgiveness and his soul will be saved right so there is there, there, there could there could be a time when this person can you know just that the word saved here meaning he can be restored back to the church right and so that's what he's uh, trying to bring across, Manki, right? So that's why it's uh, you know this verse is a little complicated, but we must understand why Paul is saying deliver one such a one to Satan. Meaning, he's not saying okay, you, you know uh, this person should 
you know just get out and die and uh, you know live in that sin itself no he's trying to say that he's brought he's out of the uh, you know protection of god so there's nothing we can do for now only god can change him right so mangi i hope that helps you and even as we go on we will uh, talk more and there'll be a little more clarity here as well right so what did paul mean by referring to the destruction of the flesh right the word flesh in greek means sax uh is it's used in different ways in the new testament it, so flesh could be just general people in general the physical body we know is flesh uh flesh could be the natural right we say don't be a fleshly person It means don't be an earthly fleshly man you know uh, don't think in the natural think in the soup in the uh, spiritual we say that right? and then flesh could be also food and a source of life and nourishment but most importantly the flesh is the carnal appetites the passions and the desires uh and this is what paul has mentioned many times so so the destruction of the flesh this passage here says meant that the individual is put out of the spiritual protection of the local body why because of their own ongoing unrepentant sinful lifestyle and what happens they become being vulnerable to the enemy and satan is able to you know uh satan takes control over this person's life what evil or trouble is not specified in this in the process of administering discipline keep in mind that the punishment was a removal of spiritual protection and not an infliction of evil on the person right so mangi this uh this sentence should help us here removal of spiritual protection over that person now does not mean now just because he's out of the spiritual protection of the church does not mean god cannot work on him we know that god's word is like a hammer and god can break through holy spirit can break through every hardened heart he can do it right but paul is looking in terms of the church as well right because if this person continues in the church the entire church is going to be in trouble right it's going to affect the church so paul is concerned about the church he's saying see if we let this happen it will grow it will become bigger other people will think well you know we are just some you know they they will not see us as, a, as an example so he's he's more concerned about the church is he concerned about the person yes that's why he says uh you know uh, put him out for now uh, yet let the lord work in him that he may be saved right so and this is not the only time we see apostle paul dealing with other people also in the church at ephesus he says hymenius and alexander the copper worker right he says these are people who fell away and uh, and he's telling he's talking to timothy he's saying timothy these are people you need to stay away from uh and they will come and cause problems but uh, you know you look after the church that's your uh, primary work and so paul delivered these men to satan that they may learn not to blaspheme that they may understand that when you come out of the protection of god the enemy is able to play with them the enemy is able to just destroy them right so basically paul is trying to say the consequences of your actions is that you are out of the spiritual authority of the church and now you must find your own way to come out of your sin you you have to face the consequences of your sin or you have a choice just return to god say god please forgive me and then god in his grace will forgive you but for now you cannot continue in the church because the church is more important very clear the apostle paul right now as leaders you and i maybe we are part of a life group we are part of a church or we are in the leadership team this is something 
we must you know always always remember now it's not like paul heard about this man and said immediately take him out of the church no it, it it's been happening for a long time right and so that's why paul is saying i i i don't understand how you all have not dealt with this problem since it's happening right so it's not something that paul just heard and said okay they may have been dealing with this person for a long time but there's no change you know one of the things we follow in apc is is more than our you know uh, uh st yes studying the word of god all of that is important but more than that also is character is to build character right uh and and that is something that we always emphasize in our bible course building character uh, because we can know many things but not have a good character right and here paul is writing a side note here uh, just a side note what must be a christian's attitude towards the local church now as you and i as believers we must understand that when we are part of a church we are in a right relationship with the lord we are in right relationship with god's people that is the congregation the local church and we have a spiritual protection we have a spiritual fellowship that comes from his body right now can we survive without a local church we may be able to but god's design is to be part of a local church there is spiritual protection you know how do we feel you know we may be going through a problem we say hey why don't you you know just tell the life group people to pray for me and when all of you all of them pray we're seeing that you know that person is coming under spiritual protection he's coming under the uh, the the protection of the local church community of believers so there's strength in that so so please keep in mind that one cannot be in the local church and continue in sin and rebellion right now the word rebellion is very important now you know it shouldn't be like we are part of a church and then we always continue to sin do the same thing again and again right we cannot be that kind of person we cannot expect the church to uh, you know to protect us to you know because we continue living in that sin we must learn to purge away and that's why in the coming verses uh, the apostle paul is bringing the whole example of the passover and the unleavened bread right let's look at verse 6 your glorifying is not good do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump right so paul is rebuking them for their boasting right uh, firstly he's rebuking them for you know you boasted about you know uh, paul apollos peter and all of that now again he's saying you're saying that you know uh, this uh, this whole thing of sexual sin and you're okay with it so paul is bringing the whole example of the east and of the unleaven bread now now the jews who are part of this local church who are hearing this letter being read to them they would have understood this very clearly right uh, a, a familiar passage this is just a little east makes the whole batch of dough rise right which means what if we tolerate the sin uh, that is there the potentially the entire church could get affected with that sexual impurity so paul is saying here deal with this matter urgently just a little bit east makes the entire batch of dough rise just a little bit of sin that's continually there continually there it's going to affect the entire local church there will be times as leaders we may have to make hard decisions it's not that we don't love the person but it's just so that we're protecting the church we're protecting the community of believers right I remember this one time there was this elderly couple uh, who were part of our church uh, and this was in another city 
and they were a good couple right they came into church and you know they every sunday they would come but one of the things i noticed was every time uh he would the, the man would come uh you know he was uh you know he would drink alcohol he would come into church uh and he would start fighting with people you know, not not fighting but he would start silly arguments now first time a couple of the youth came and told me you know pastor see this person he's uh, drinking and i thought okay it's okay you know uh, let me let's see you know he's coming maybe he's going through a problem so i let it go second time he came i spoke to him i said see as you're coming to church i know you may be going through a problem but try not to drink and come you may have your problems but you know you come to church in the morning uh, and you know just attend the service god will speak to you trust god to help you to you know come out of this uh, but he was not he said okay but then the next sunday he did the same thing and people are raising their hands and uh, worshiping he would you know he he also came during the worship i was leading the worship he came during the worship and he said put your hand down i can't see the lyrics and i was so taken aback and then after the church service he would you know uh, uh, you know keep talking with people and talking loudly and all of it so i went to him and i said see uh, he was an elderly gentleman i said to him see this is not right i don't want you to do this and this is a warning now he is probably he's a you know he's a businessman who's retired you know gone through life and i was just maybe 32 33 years old and he said to me you're a small boy you're telling me what to do i said this is what it is if you come again this way you will not be able to attend church I gave him two warnings. Right now, why did I do this? Because I know that there are young people in our church who have the problem of drinking, right? And they are trying to overcome, right? And I know that they are good young people who are, you know, who are in this with the problem. Now, if I keep quiet or if I just let it go, what will these youth do? Next, they will drink and come to church. And they will begin to, you know, cause problems. Right? So I had to deal with it. I said, but he came the next Sunday. He did the same thing. And I called him, and I said, "This is your last Sunday. Please don't come to this church. Please find another church." He said, "Oh, you don't know how much tight I give. You don't know what." I said, it "Doesn't matter. How much tight you give, all of that, you're giving it to God. So it doesn't matter." Uh, but he was really offended. He was not willing to change. But it it became a problem later on. You know, he was not letting me go. He would, you know, tell or he would start calling the church people and say, "Leave that church. He's not a good leader and all of that." Uh, you know, but none of them even believed him. Uh, and praise God for that. You know, the church was a, uh, you know, they understood what was going on. And so there will be times you have to make these decisions. But is it that we left, you know, I asked him to get, move out of the church so that, you know, uh, uh, let him continue in his sin? No. I told him, well, we told him, uh, uh, you know, we're praying for you. Pray that God helps you to overcome this. But I cannot continue because if you come this way, the young people in our church are going to follow the same thing. And there's too much of confusion. There's no peace. There's no after the church service. You're talking loudly. You're shouting, and um, you know the, the youth are not like that. They're very kind. They're very good people, youth, and so I don't want them to learn this. Right? And so he had to go. Right. Hard decision, yes. And we were only about forty people in the church that time. Uh, but I'm glad that we did it because after that things were so smooth. Everything went well. Uh, and you know uh, these are hard decisions but as leaders don't take the dust and put it under the carpet and say okay it's done no it's still under the carpet right so paul is drawing from the old testament here the feast of the passover 
what happened to the feast. Now, the feast of the Passover happened on the 14th day of the first month, right? Uh, just a background. So leavened bread was not eaten on the 14th day of the feast of the Passover. Then for the next seven days, from 15th to the 21st, was the feast of the unleavened bread. So basically what they would do is the entire house was cleaned, thoroughly cleaned in preparation for these two feasts, the feast of the unleavened bread and the Passover. So the whole house was cleaned. The Jews, uh, uh, what they would do is they would not eat anything that was leavened, right? So uh, this, this represented their separation from their old life and their oppression in Egypt. So Paul is saying here, this whole lump, Right? Therefore, purge out, verse 7, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. Right? Uh, this is who we really are as believers. We are unleavened. That means we are separated from sin. Right? And God has made us because we are born again. And Paul is telling the Corinthian church, just like a little yeast is, you know, right, causes the whole door to rise. You separate yourself from sin because Christ was our Passover lamb. He is the true fulfillment of the feast of the Passover. Right? Uh, and, and so this is such a powerful, I'm sure the Jews would have had their eyes opened. Wow. We do this for seven days. But now God is saying, do it every time. We need to purge ourselves constantly away from sin. Keep that leaven out of our lives. Because a little leaven or a little sin can destroy our entire body. Now, is there anyone among us who's living without sin? Maybe not. Maybe some of us are going through these seasons. We all have our own challenges. Now, this is where grace comes in. We can go back to God and say, God, help me to overcome. Give me the strength by your Holy Spirit. Or we can say, God, I'm not able to. I might as well just continue to live this and just you know, be unwilling to repent. Or we can say, you know, there's nothing wrong in this, so it's okay. Right? Uh, we have choices that we can make, but you know, we, we as believers must choose what's right. Go to God and say, God, forgive me. Is there any sin? Is there anything that God cannot bring us out of? It could be pornography, suicidal tendencies, depression, jealousy, hatred, pride. God can bring us out of all of these things. Uh, but we just have to say, God, remove that, keep that leaving out. Separated from us, help us to overcome. And so that's what Paul is uh, trying to communicate to the church here. Then he goes on, relating to those who are those in willful sin. Verse 9 I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexual immorality, sexually immoral people. Right now, Paul was written. Written, uh, you know, he's he's talking about the letter that he had written earlier to this. Right now, remember, First Corinthians chapter, the letter of First Corinthians is a response to what has come. Right, so there's a letter that's come. Uh, okay, Apostle Paul, these are some problems you're seeing in the church. Some are saying Paul, Apollos, uh, Peter, and this division. Second problem, the sexual sin, and uh, these are. So Paul, First Corinthians is a letter that is in response to a letter that's already come in, but we don't have records of that. Right? Paul warns us not to mingle with sexually immoral people. And he says, First uh, Corinthians fifteen, he says, "Do not be deceived; evil company corrupts good habits." Now. We must understand this the context of what he's trying to say. Right? If a believer is in continuous sin, unrepentant, the scriptures teach us to keep away from them, 
Remember that verse in the Old Testament, iron sharpens iron. Right? If I'm with a person who's always proud, walking in pride, I will rub off that. If I'm with a person who's always jealous about others, sooner or, sooner or later, even I will start feeling jealous. If I'm, a if I'm a person who's always abusive to others, sooner or later, if I'm spending more time with that person, I will be the same thing. Because iron sharpens iron. Right? Maybe all your life we may not have been jealous, but if you spend, uh, if you have a very close friend who's always jealous, uh, in six months to a year, you'll also end up being jealous. And that's how it is. As by nature, we are like that. And so Paul is saying, it's not like, you know, we should not have friends, right? It's good. We must have friends. We must have people around us. You know, uh, I go and share the gospel with my friends who are still drinking and they're into all these bad habits, right? I still am friends with them. But they are people who are willing to change, right? But there are friends who I have who are not willing to change, right? So I tell them, hey, there's, you know, uh, I want to be. I want to help you, but uh, I try not to. I don't spend time with them, but I do go and I sit with people, my friends who drink, smoke. They all they have bad habits, right? But they're willing to change. They say, Paul, I don't know how do I do it. Help me. I want to get rid of this, you know. Uh, and so we're there for them. But if we are going on saying no, then you know, uh, I would not want to mingle with such a person, right? Uh, and there's a we should realize how how a dynamics of a relationship should be built. And as leaders, we will learn it, right? You know, one person once told me, uh, you know, there was another past her who had once told me you know we were talking and uh, I he said to me uh, you know we were just discussing and I was saying you know I have a lot of friends but there's some friends who I don't really talk to much then he said you know what Jesus came for the sinners for the sick one you know how can you you know change how can you destroy and how can you chase them away or reject them Jesus came for the sick but the sick were willing to be healed they had the faith that they can be healed. Right? They were willing. And, and so we must remember that, you know, in what we are doing, have good relationships. Now, have friends. You will have friends who are, you know, uh, going through different problems in life. Talk to them. Help them to bring, you know, in, in their life. But if they are unwilling to change, then it's better to just move on. Now, for whose good? For your good, right? Uh, it's for your good. So what about grace here? Paul is sharing with us this revelation. The Apostle Paul talks the most about grace. He, every time he says, grace be unto you, grace, you know, he gives a benediction. He says, grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus. Everywhere he talks about grace. But why is Paul not making a mention of grace? And he's why is he so firm in this, this whole truth here? Now, this will answer your question. God is a God of grace. And God is a God of truth also. So grace and truth always come together. Okay, Grace and truth always comes. Is there God's grace? Yes. Is there truth? Yes. What is the truth? You're living in sin. Is there God's grace? Yes. Grace must be given with truth. Right? Now, grace without truth is not God's grace. It is some other grace. It's just a false love, right? If I love my children, I have to correct them, right? If I don't correct them, I don't love them. I mean, you know, I have to correct them. 
there are times I, I teach my children and I tell them, you know, this is how I want it to be done because they're growing up. He's one, my elder son is seven years old. There are certain things he must know. So I, I tell him, okay, you have to do it this way. Right? And, and sometimes he misses out. He may not do it the right way, but there's grace, but there's also truth. And I tell him, why are we doing it this way? Right? Because it's helpful. It's going to help you when you grow, right? Uh, okay, uh, we've let's take a break, right? Let's take a break. We'll come back and we'll spend some more time here. Ten minutes break. We'll come back at ten o'clock. Thank you. <laughs> 